When I was 18 years old, I was taking this advanced C++ course. And as a final project, my dad arranged for me to meet with the software team he was working with at the time. Now, they were working on an air traffic control system. And they were all still wrapping their minds around this newfangled, object-oriented programming paradigm. I don't remember a lot about that meeting anymore. Mostly what I remember was saying polymorphism over and over again. And they were all like, hmm, polymorphism, good point. Anyway, a few months later, they hired me on as a contractor. And I've been working in software ever since. And most of it has been object-oriented. Now, along the way, I had to unlearn a lot of what I thought it meant to do OO. Eventually, I discovered the writings of Alan Kay, who was the one to synthesize the idea of OO in the first place. Kay said that as far as he was concerned, OO was just about messaging, encapsulation of state process, and extreme late binding of all things. He and his team at Xerox Park created Smalltalk to embody OO ideas. All of our modern OO languages are descended, to some degree, from Smalltalk. To Kay, the most important part of all of this was the idea of sending messages. He said, I thought of objects being like biological cells or individual computers on a network, only able to communicate with messages. In fact, he even said he regretted calling it object-oriented, because that put the emphasis in the wrong place. This was a clarifying conception of object orientation. Once I understood it, I did my best to apply and teach OO in terms of objects sending messages to each other. But the more I did, the more something felt off. Let's compare sending a message in the mail to sending a message in a typical OO language. When I send a message in the mail, I summarize the information the recipient needs to act on it. When I send an OO message, I send references to objects, which have references to other objects, and them to other objects, and so on, and so on. If I send you a message in the mail, but I write it in a language you don't understand, or if it never reaches you, what happens to me? Nothing. But what happens with an OO message send? Disaster. And when I send a message in the mail, I don't have to freeze up at the mailbox waiting for a response or an acknowledgement. But that's exactly the way it works when we send a message in Java or JavaScript or Ruby. There is a cognitive dissonance here between the metaphors we use and the actual semantics of our languages. Now, a lot of people will tell you that the original big mistake of object-oriented programming was having mutable state. I disagree. I believe that the original sin of OO was return values. Return values are a fundamental denial of the messaging paradigm. And even Kay said that Smalltalk never quite arrived at the vision that he and his team had set for it. The later languages it inspired haven't done any better. So here is the big lie of object-oriented programming for the last 40 years. We keep saying we're sending messages, but we're really not. It's really the same call and return semantics we inherited from the procedural era. Procedures are goal-obsessed, uninterrupted, blocking operations fixated on success. A way to say this in a single word is that they are transactional. It's bad enough that we often talk in terms of sending messages when we're really writing transactional code. But the bigger problem is that transactional systems, as a rule, are brittle, and they deal poorly with surprises. And this is where I'm going to take a bit of a left turn. Because for me, the example of transactional thinking that has most challenged me isn't a software system at all. The experience that has led me to radically reconsider the transactional mode comes from my own life. From a very young age, I had a clear idea of the kind of lifestyle that I was supposed to achieve. And so after I got that first software job, I set myself single-mindedly to arriving at that goal. I became kind of like a procedure, methodically checking things off one after another get married, have kids, build my professional profile so I could level up my career, so I could do my work from a house in the mountains with my family around me. And all along the way, I was completely focused on the future. Things like hobbies and friendships fell by the wayside. I'd have time for all that stuff later. I just needed my return value, and then I could start living. And I got there, actually. I arrived. And I got to briefly enjoy it. And then a surprise occurred and it all fell apart. And I realized in the aftermath 
that I'd sunk a big chunk of my lifespan into arriving instead of actually living. Now, my purpose here isn't to turn this talk into a therapy session, but what I've realized in reflecting on my failures in both life and software is that they both flow from a common source. I've come to call this source the transactional fallacy. The transactional fallacy occurs every time we try to model a process as if it were a transaction. And whether it crops up in code or in life, it's fundamentally a philosophical problem. In fact, this is a known point of division among philosophers. As Kelso Vieira writes, we often see the world as a world of things or objects, but process philosophers think processes, not objects, are fundamental. Now, I happen to believe that software and philosophy are inextricably tangled up. Writing software is the practice of applied philosophy. We use code as a way to reflect our understanding of the world. And our ways of modeling the world, in turn, influence our perception of reality. You can't do this stuff 40 hours a week without it affecting how you think. Once you start identifying it, the transactional fallacy is everywhere in software. For instance, I see it all the time with forms. When we have a form and we discover we have to split it across multiple pages, and that forces a significant amount of rework. And then we discover that people are stopping in the middle of a form and coming back later to find the session expired and all their work gone, and so we have to do a bunch more rework to make it save state. And then we find out that we actually need to be able to query on the data in incomplete forms, which means we have to get the data into our actual database, and this requires even more rework. This is an example of the transactional fallacy informing the design. Forms are a way we try to force communication with people into being transactional. But communication is a process. Lately, I see it a lot in web app code bases where the developers have tried to adopt a service object design for the app logic. There's a workflow that initially only hits one of the services, but later it gets more complex and it needs to hit multiple services in order to complete and the developers have started finding ways to sneak little bundles of intermediate state from one service to the next, often via the browser. This forms an implicit web of dependencies that's totally invisible unless you have deep knowledge of the workflows. That's the transactional fallacy again, trying to model a coherent process as a set of independent transactions. The transactional fallacy has a symbol. You're probably already familiar with it, even if you might not realize it. It's the spinning beach ball of death. This is the universal symbol that a programmer expected something to either finish or fail, more or less instantaneously, and it did neither of those things. So much of what we model are actually processes. Purchase orders are drafted, updated, approved, and finalized. Users are invited, confirmed, onboarded, elevated, and then suspended. If you've ever integrated services using RESTful APIs, you know that HTTP requests are processes, not transactions. But we arbitrarily slice these processes across multiple objects, and then we wonder why our systems are so hard to understand. What if we stopped focusing on the structure and started looking for the process? This is the space that I've begun to explore. But right off the bat, I ran into a problem of communication. The word process is too ambiguous. We already use it to mean a lot of different things in the software world. So, as an alternative, I've adopted the word narrative, because paying attention to processes naturally means learning to tell the story of systems. And the more you look, the more you realize it's narratives everywhere. The project you are working on right now is a narrative. Your software team is a narrative. Your own cells are constantly dying and being replaced but you still have a coherent identity. It's not so much that you're a person as that you are constantly personing. You are a living narrative. So let's talk about what it means to weave narratives. But remember, the transactional fallacy is a problem of philosophy and worldview. So I'm going to focus not on software, but on how I've been learning to think about my own life. And maybe along the way, we can find some hints for how this might apply to code. First off, a narrative has a direction, not a goal. I know they say it's important to have goals, but personally, I've given them up. Instead, I try to have some heuristics or arrows that indicate when I'm headed in the right direction. For instance, instead of thinking about the job I want to have, 
I have a mental list of people I'd like to have a beer with someday. And then I think, what sort of person would I become in order to be in their circles? What kind of work in the world would I need to be doing to find myself hanging out with them? You might recognize Adam Savage from the show Mythbusters. For the longest time, he was at the top of my list. And then, this past February, I was invited to an event in Chicago where I spent a couple days hanging out with him and a hundred or so other amazing people. What put me at that event wasn't a single-minded focus on the goal of meeting Adam. Instead, it was a side effect of regularly checking in on the direction of my work. What does it mean for code to have a direction instead of a goal? Well, it could mean adopting the actor model, where we model narratives as actors that keep trying. It could mean acknowledging that all or nothing thinking isn't good enough. We need feedback earlier than all done. So we look for ways to model operations with batches or streaming. Having a direction implies that a narrative is constantly becoming. Becoming requires being aware of where and how I am now. And that means a narrative must be aware of itself. Now, the best teacher you can possibly have for self-awareness is right with you all the time. It's your own body. Your body has no ideal end state. Your body interrupts you in the middle of trying to reach some return value with reminders of the narrative of life. It says, I'm sleepy, I'm hungry, I'm cold. As programmers, I think we have a tendency to want to be brains in jars. We like to pretend that our ideas can be completely separated from our bodies. But learning to embrace narrative as a person means acknowledging your inherent embodiment. A great way to do this is to take up mindfulness meditation or a yoga practice. Many people enjoy running or biking or lifting or hiking. But as you do these activities, be careful. Because we hackers are so habituated to being brains in jars that we find ways of taking ourselves out of our bodies and staying in our analytical brains, even when we're running or lifting weights. We measure and we quantify instead of learning to listen to our bodies. Now, in case it's not clear, what I'm saying is, throw away your Fitbit. Learn to feel when you need to take more steps or when you're dehydrated. Learn to feel your target heart rate zone. What does self-awareness and embodiment mean for code? Well, it could mean coding for observability first, instead of as an afterthought. Knowing where you are and where you're going means you also know where you've been. Embracing narrative means embracing state. And state is simply the acknowledgement that everything we want to accomplish, with computers or otherwise, involves the passage of time. That any narrative in the world, whether it's a workflow or a human being, is an accumulation of events and their lasting effects. As developers, we love the idea of a clean reset. It's so simplifying. But embracing state means accepting history and the idea that there are no clean slates. The domain-driven design community offers some useful resources for working with state and history in code. Event storming can help a team discover their domain model using timelines instead of static states. Temporal modeling is a way of looking at systems first in terms of events, not structure. And event sourcing provides a way to construct code that makes events first class. Embracing history means embracing entropy, and that means embracing failure. But in narrative, we look for ways to fail forwards, because we realize that there will always be surprises. Like this one time I was minding my own business, editing a video, and a scorpion fell and landed on my monitor right in front of my face. I swear I am not making this up. Now, what typically happens when our code in a modern OO language encounters the software equivalent of an unexpected scorpion error? It raises an exception, right? And in the process, unwinds the stack, throws away any local state, and probably tears down some connections while it's at it. This is kind of like burning the whole house down. Something I've observed over the course of my career is that the more focused we are on preventing failure, the more catastrophic the failures tend to be when they finally manage to get through. The narrative perspective is less focused on preventing failure and more on how we adapt and keep going. This means being okay with being not okay. It means learning to sit and work skillfully with failure and suffering.
In code, being okay with being not okay can mean modeling some failures as outcomes rather than as exceptions. In other words, treating errors as data. It can mean structuring our narratives using the saga pattern, with compensating actions lined up to bring the system back to a consistent state if something goes wrong. Most importantly, I think it means putting less of our time and energy into correctness, and more of it into our capabilities for mitigation and remediation. How will we minimize the damage when things go wrong? The resilience engineering community is giving us some powerful insights into how we deal with surprises. And one of the first things they'll tell you is that you can't encode resilience into a piece of software. You can only build resilience into the broader socio-technical system that the code is a part of. Which brings me to the final element of the narrative perspective. A narrative is interdependent. Up until now, every advancement to the state of the art in software design has boiled down to making the parts of our systems more isolated and independent from each other. Procedures, modules, interfaces, dependency injection. And of course, this was the primary value proposition of object orientation, that it would make our code more encapsulated. But no pattern scales infinitely. And as we make software systems of greater scale and complexity, we've hit a point where independence ceases to be a virtue. In distributed, service-oriented systems, we're learning to use patterns like back-off algorithms and queue back pressure to keep from overloading other services. We use the circuit breaker pattern to gracefully degrade service when a collaborator is experiencing problems. The authors of the book Reactive Design Patterns make a strong case that dependency injection in microservices makes a system fragile, and that it's better to use an Erlang-style supervisor hierarchy where services are responsible for monitoring and restarting their children. The common element to all these patterns is that they all involve software agents being aware of and holding state for their collaborators. These are all rudimentary forms of empathy in code. They are ways for software components to embrace interdependence. Humans are even more complex systems, and we don't benefit from encapsulation. In fact, one of the realizations I've had in the past couple of years is that my best insights don't come from deep contemplation alone in the mountains. Instead, I'm my favorite version of myself when I'm in constant contact with colleagues, friends, and loved ones. As the cognitive scientist and philosopher Abeba Berhaini puts it, a person is a person through other persons. Our identity doesn't arise just from within us, but from the connections between us. Which makes the current crisis all the more distressing. We are in the midst of a global emergency forcing us to self-isolate. It's a situation almost tailor-made to bring out our worst brain-in-a-jar impulses. But maybe this crisis can be a forcing function for us to learn that we aren't independent that self-isolation doesn't mean we have to self-encapsulate. The COVID-19 epidemic is a surprise of epic proportions, disrupting all of our transactions and forcing us to weave a new narrative a day at a time. Maybe we can use it to learn to embrace direction instead of fragile goal orientation, to get in touch with where we are in our bodies, to acknowledge that these events will have lasting effects and we need to fail forwards into new normals. And most of all, to learn that complex systems in software or society need to be interdependent to be resilient.